Welcome to Voices, Hudson Valley Community College's Library Lecture Series. Thank you so much for being here. It's really great to see such a good turnout. My name is Bonnie Cook and I teach in the English department at the college. Before I introduce our distinguished and remarkable guests, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered here on the sacred homelands of the Mohicaniac or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to them and to their ancestors. Voices is a library lecture series that has for the past 23 years presented speakers on diverse, timely, and enduring issues in order to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Voices will be on hiatus in the spring, so I'd like to publicly remember and thank Professor Robert Matthew for founding Voices and for his vision and dedication that made these talks possible. Additionally, I'd like to thank all the past and current members of the Voices Committee who've worked hard to bring these interesting speakers to our stage. Thanks also to the print shop for the fantastic brochures Thanks to our tech people for all their invaluable assistance, without which you wouldn't be able to hear any of us. And thanks to My Lynn for interpreting for us today. Now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our human guests, and Ellen Kalish and her assistant Chris will introduce you to our feathered guests. Ellen Kalish is the founder and executive director of Ravensbeard Wildlife Center, now in its 24th year. Ravensbeard is a not-for-profit wildlife rehabilitation facility located in Saugerties, New York. Every year, Ravensbeard rescues and cares for over 400 injured, orphaned, and ill birds with the goal of releasing them back into the wild, and their release rate is over 60%. The Ravensbeard Center specializes in raptors, which you will see today but will also take in other birds. And Ravensbeard will also help you find care for other injured wild animals, should you have one that needs aid, uh, through New York State's network of licensed wildlife rehabilitators. Ellen Kalish is, among other things, an artist, a photographer, a naturalist, and the author of the children's book, The Christmas Owl, which I have to show you. <laughs> about the little bird that was found in the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. She's won an award from the Woodstock Nature Conservancy and has appeared on NBC's Today Show. And I'm holding this up because Ravensbeard is a not-for-profit organization, so if you bought one of these lovely little books or a little ornament, it will help. The money will go towards saving and protecting more birds. So, uh, also, I would like to invite you, if you would like, way in the back to come closer. We are going to see the live birds, and the closer you are, you know, the more you will be able to see them. So I really encourage you to get up and move forward if you would like to do so. There will be questions and answers, uh, and you're welcome after the talk to come up and look at the various items that they have on the stage. So we are so pleased that you are here with us today. Please welcome Ellen Kalish and her assistant, Chris Wernai. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so glad that um, you all came today because it's a really special um, adventure to be able to see these birds up close. So as a director of the Wildlife Center, we get all kinds of birds coming in, from hummingbirds to bald eagles. We also take in reptiles and um, and hopefully, you know, our goal is to get every bird back out there. Um, we are not veterinarians. We don't pretend to be. We work very closely with our veterinarians, which is why our rele release rate is so high. So um, the, the average is about 50% of all the birds that come in are usually, um, usually released. And... Um, because we work so closely with our vets, um, our release rate is a little bit higher. So some of the birds that I have here today are birds that can't go back into the wild for one reason or another. And they are now um, adopted 
Um, I will have them forever until I pass. And then they go on to my son, who's a veterinarian, and um, he can follow my footsteps. So the first bird I want to bring out is a red-tailed hawk. This is Sienna. Sienna came to us about three years ago. Um, she's a red-tailed hawk, as you can see. They don't get their red tail until they're one year old. So um, for the first you know, year of their life, it's striped and kind of camouflaged. Um, Sienna was raised in someone's living room. And so um, I have a friend, my master falconer, who was talking to this person, and he said, yeah, I have a hawk in my living room. It terrorizes my wife and kids, and, um, and it's really cool. And so my friend said, oh, you must have a permit. And he said, what do you need that for? So he quickly called me, and he said, look, I'm going to try and get this bird away from this person. He obviously doesn't have, <laughs> doesn't have a permit, and... Um, and I guess he explained he could go to jail um, or be th find thousands of birds because all birds of prey are considered migratory birds and protected by the government. So he called me. He was so excited. He said, I got the bird away from him. <laughs> it, he brought it to my doorstep, and um, he said, you know, come and get her as quickly as you can. So I raced over, and I looked at this poor bird, she was um, maybe three months old. She had almost no feathers on her head from poor nutrition. Um, we're lucky she didn't have metabolic bone disease for um, the bad nutrition that she was given. So I can only guess she was given chopped meat, maybe some chicken breasts, and that's not enough for a bird of prey. They need the whole animal. When these guys are done eating, there is nothing left. Even the tail of a rat goes down. And so they need all that uh, nutrition to have feathers that uh, will help them fly and uh, keep them warm. Feathers are amazing for a variety of different um, coverings. So because one person was selfish and decided to raise her in his living room, she has no fear of people. And that's the reason why she is unreleasable. Not that she couldn't catch food or you know, bank a turn. She can do all that stuff. But she doesn't relate as a bird. She thinks she's a person. And that's a problem. So the DEC has made it illegal to um, let these birds go back into the wild. Because if one of us was eating a hot dog or a piece of chicken, at the picnic table and she thought it looked good, she'd have no problem coming down and taking it from you, which is what they do with you know, other birds. They steal, right? So um, once we got her into the clinic, we gave her super vitamins, all the nutrition, all the, the rodents she could eat. Um, and within about a year, she grew all her head feathers back her tail and her wing feathers were sheared off from being in a parrot cage. And um, when you have you know, a four-foot wingspan, a parrot cage is not going to cut it. So that is her story. So red-tailed hawks are the largest of the Budio family. They are um, slow because they're so big. They need a long runway to take off and to land. Um, you're going to see these birds hunting in dead tree snags on the side of the thruway, um, parks. They love to hunt in wide open fields. Um, one of their favorite food is rabbit. Um, but they'll take a skunk. They'll take a, a chipmunk. They'll take just about anything that runs on the ground. They're too slow to catch other birds. Um, and so 
has anyone ever seen a big hawk or a big um, raptor being chased by little songbirds? Yeah. yeah. So why does that happen? Well, it's not might at that point. It's intent. And so those songbirds have a nest or babies nearby, and a mother bird is going to do whatever it takes to drive out any kind of danger. And so for her, a red-tailed hawk is danger. And so they will come down and hit the hawk. They'll peck it. They'll do whatever they can. I've even seen a picture of Audubon that has a hawk with a bird riding on its shoulders. So they're fierce. And um, it's not about size. It's about territory and protecting their family. So do these guys protect their families? Yeah, they do. Um, you really don't want to go and climb up into a tree where a red-tailed hawk is nesting. Um, <clears throat> they will bomb you and dive and try and foot you. So um, when you take a look at these talons, they're all about an inch long, and they're just like can openers. They're meant to go through flesh and bone. So um, nobody wants a, a red-tailed hawk to chase them. Um, usually, they do nest about 50 feet in the woods off a large field, which is their hunting territory. Um, they do not migrate. They're here year-round. They build stick nests, and I call it they bring in new furniture every year, make it nice, ready for their babies. and. Um, and they raise two to four chicks. So it takes about, um, depending on the, the bird, it depends on uh, the incubation period and how long the parents actually feed the babies. Um, but it's anywhere between um, six and eight weeks that these babies grow up and they're fully ready to, to go out there and wreak havoc on the rodent population. So um, there's nothing wrong with Sienna. She, you know, she is just going to be with us forever. And um, lucky for me that, um, you know, she came to Ravensbeard um, because most other uh, rehab places would put a bird down for something like that where they can't release it. So she's got a good life. And um, anyone have any questions about red tails? Yes. So does she see forward and sideways? Yes. 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 So um, does she see forwards and out to the side? And the answer is yes. She can't see behind her because um, she doesn't really need to. She's pretty much the apex predator of the uh, of the woods, but. Um, Yes, they have amazing vision. They can see at least three times better than we can. And um, they say an eagle can read a newspaper a mile away. I don't know how they tested that. <laughs> Question? Every year. Yep. I'll come back to you. <laughs> yes. Oh, it was just the feathers were sheared off from banging into wire. So there was nothing wrong with her wings. They're perfect. Um, it was just the feathers that were. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And every bird molts um, every feather on their body every year. So they start when they're nesting, and they continue to molt through the early fall. And so that is for the migratory birds that are going to be migrating, um, they all have a brand new winter coat. So anything that's been damaged during the um, sitting on eggs or, or finding food for their babies, um, it, all, it all goes away when they get their new coat. OK.
So there's a poem that I say to um, children when I'm in schools. And it's silly, but it works. It makes people remember. Eyes in front likes to hunt. Eyes on the side likes to hide. So that's basically the rule of thumb with um, any animal. So if you think about mice, if you think about um, just about any animal that is a prey animal, they have big eyes on either side, and they can almost see 360 behind them. However, these guys can't see behind them. And the reason why they can't, can you turn around? <laughs> yes. The reason they can't see behind them is because their eyes are fixed in their skull. Most birds of prey do have eyes that are fixed in their skull. Um, the great blue heron, for instance, can move his eyeballs, which is very interesting. But these guys don't have any muscles in their head for eyes. Um, they've pared down to be as light as they can for flight, hollow bones. Um, owls actually have very interesting characteristics that are only uh, found on owls. And that is um, because of their eyesight, they have been given seven extra vertebrae in their neck to be able to turn their heads about 260 degrees. So nature is just amazing how it just prepares these guys. Um, people think owls are smart, the wise old owl, book owl. I mean, there's a lot of connotations, and they're not very bright at all. <laughs> so I hate to burst that bubble. But they are amazing mousetraps and incredible hunters. They have um, an adaptation on their feathers that creates less wind resistance. So an owl's feathers are fringed on the edges. And I'm going to pass these around so you can see them. A hawk's feather is flat and straight. And so you can hear a hawk take off. You can hear a pigeon, a goose. You know, um, the stripy one is the owl, and the more solid white and brown is the hawk. And you'll be able to see all these, oh, <laughs> all these, um, the way the feathers are made. So it's silent flight because they're nocturnal. And um, they have large eyes to collect the moon and the starlight. But even if it's pitch dark, new moon, clouds everywhere. These birds have been put in a chamber where they don't allow any light. They send a mouse in there, and within seconds, the owls have the mouse in their talons and fly back up to their perch. So they really don't need to see in order to hunt. They use their ears. So if you ever look at a model of an owl's ears, one is upward and um, in the front, and the other is downward in the back. So they literally hear surround sound symphonies. Um, and they can hunt just by listening. That's how an owl can dive into a foot of snow, grab a mouse, and fly back to his perch to eat it. Owls also have pellets, which everyone has heard about. And um, if you can't find an owl in the wild, you can try calling out to it. In English, um, it sounds like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? But a barred owl is going to sound like this. <laughs> so they have that little southern drawl at the end. And you'll never forget that that is a barred owl. They talk to each other constantly. Um, owls don't see color like other birds do. so. The camouflage is just perfect for them. Um, they will attract a mate. They mate for life. Can you look at the audience? And so um, 
they're wonderful parents. They basically work until uh, August, September with their babies, making sure that they can hunt and know, you know all the things that they're supposed to know. So this is Hudson. He came to us because he had a car accident. He was driving too fast. No, I'm teasing. He bounced off a windshield. And uh, most people don't even know when they've hit an owl. Um, so he bounced off the windshield, and it was in a heap on the side of the road. A man saw him and um, thought he was dead, but he stopped the car. And um, when he walked over to him, the owl looked up at him. His eyes were swollen shut um, from the impact of the car. And it took about three weeks of eye drops, medications, um, steroids to bring everything back to normal. Once his eyes did open, we thought he was a great candidate for release because he had no fractures. We take all the birds um, that we even uh, question if there's a fracture. We take them all and get x-rays. So we know exactly what we're dealing with. So we thought, this is great. We'll just give him some TLC, feed him up, and we'll be able to release him. But we had an ophthalmologist come. She's retired and um, came to see these birds for free. We had a number of owls, that, uh, at least six owls that came in, all with head trauma. And um, two-thirds of them were blind. So he can see periphery, but he can't see anything smack in front of him. So um, once we learned of his, his issue, that was it. We're not going to put an owl back into the wild that can't see but 10% of side. So we decided to name him Hudson. And, um, and he's been with us now for maybe five years. So um, in the wild, they live to be about 15 to 18 in captivity, they can live to be 20. Um, the red tails begin at uh, 25 to 30. And in captivity, uh, my master falconer had a red tail from the time it was born, 35 years. So they do do much better in captivity when they don't have to hunt, when they have medical attention for free, when they have all the food they can want. And so life is a lot easier when you have all those nets. So um, let's see. What are you staring at? Nothing. <laughs> He's listening to everything. Um, so these birds uh, basically eat rodents. Um, they have four talons, two in the front and two in the back. Hawks have three in the front and one in the back. They can actually rotate their thumb to be three talons in the front or two and two, um, depending on what size animal they're trying to catch. So with all raptors, the females are one third larger than the males. Science isn't really sure why that is. But because they're larger, they can catch larger prey. They can incubate their eggs and keep them dry and warm from bad weather. Um, and so they're not competing for the same food. So they both take turns incubating. They both take turns feeding and hunting. And, um, and they stay with the babies till the very end. So um, every now and then, you'll hear them talking to their babies because they don't see color. They have to announce themselves in and out of the territory. So a conversation might go like this. Honey, I'm home. She'll say, oh, good. What did you catch? And he'll say, oh, I got a mouse. She'll say, wonderful. Bring it on in. So that's when we hear these birds talking to each other in the spring. They're communicating because she doesn't see that he is her mate. She just sees a silhouette and brown and white. So um, when she does actually talk to him, then they know who is who. 
just like if we were to close our eyes and someone in the class were to say something, if we're in class with them every day, we're going to know that voice from just being near them. And same thing with these guys. So sometimes you will hear um, the babies talking back and forth to them. They sometimes sound like a barrel of monkeys. Some of the sounds they make um, could be uh, anything from who, 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 ah, 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 and then anything in between. So the babies are complaining, I'm hungry, you're not feeding me enough, blah, blah, blah. And um, it's a whole natural dynamic. This bird has a very interesting job in that he is a surrogate daddy. So we get a lot of owls in in the spring. Um, most of them can't be re-nested because we don't know where the nest is, or they've been dropped by maybe a hawk in a different area. And so um, once the babies are then self-feeding, we'll put them in with him. And we actually had a female. Uh, at the same time, she had a broken wing, but the wing wound up healing. and. Um, all three babies, well, they basically teach them everything they need to know um, outside in a flight cage. In fact, the um, female took her job so serious, she attacked me twice trying to go in to feed. So um, it's really special to be able to have a, a surrogate parent, if not two. So right now, um, we released uh, two great horned owls. Um, that grew up, the baby grew up with another female that came in with a broken wing. And it doesn't matter. They don't care if it's their baby or not. That instinct kicks in as soon as they hear the baby cry, kind of like mammals lactate when babies cry. Um, and so they just take over and do all the rest of the uh, work that we could never, ever teach them. So that's Hudson's story. Anyone have questions about barred owls? Yes. So, uh, how, so with each of these raptors, uh, raptors uh, how do they, how, as, as top predators, like birds that are, how do they adjust the ecological and the pesticide conditions to feel in their natural environment? Amazing. So how do these birds affect the natural environment of pests and rodent control? Well, um, I ha actually have a little, um, it's, it's an experiment. It's a study on mice. And I'm going to put her away, and we're going to go through that really quickly um, because it's so important to know. Yeah, there should be one more page with the two mice on it. Great. So um, normally I call up volunteers, but we're going to race through this because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so we're going to take two mice, and we're going to do a study on these two mice. Um, it's a male and female. We're going to put them together. After three months, mice can reproduce. So that means four times a year, a mouse will have a litter of babies. They can have anywhere from two to 10 babies. Um, most of the time, they have more than they need. <laughs> and so after one year, if everyone lived, if everything was perfect, uh, they had enough to eat, enough to drink, blah, 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 we would have 160 mice. That's one year. Yeah, yeah. The second year, if we were to leave all those mice to breed and to have their families, and they had plenty of food and everything went well, after two years, we would have 1,800 mice. <laughs> so, and there's one page stuck up. So, 1,800 mice in two years. This is why we need these predators. If we go one more year, 
three years of mouse studies, and all the conditions are perfect. No one dies. No one gets eaten. The mice can um, live a long time. After three years, does anyone want to guess how many mice we would have? No? We will have 54,000 mice. So this is the reason why birds of prey are so important. Even in the cities, the peregrine falcons have come back, and um, the red tails nest on the sides of the skyscrapers. And um, they hunt pigeon and duck, which there are a lot of, and the red tails mainly hunt the rats. Hopefully, they're not poisoned. So this is why these birds are so important in our ecosystem. I have one more bird to show. Thank you, Chris. Oh, no. This is a hissy fit. <laughs> His food is still in the box, and um, I took him away from it. So he's not going to be nice for this lecture. I can tell already. His name is T-Rex because he makes me bleed more than any of the big birds. Um, you forget because he's so darn cute. He's an um, American kestrel, and they're the smallest of the falcon family. American kestrels are the birds that you're going to see along the same open fields as the red-tailed hawks. They hunt in the same fields. They don't bother each other. These birds, being the smallest of the falcon family, are one of the only birds that can hover besides a hummingbird. So they, they hunt about six to eight feet off a big open field, and they fly really low. And if something moves or motions in the grass, they'll stand there and hover. And if it's not edible, they'll continue on. Get your glove. <laughs> um, and so they're amazing birds. Falcon, the whole falcon family is just um, built for speed. These birds also, thank you. Just hold on to the end of that. These birds, so I'm going to let him walk around <laughs> so you can see this little guy up close. Um, and if he's away from me, he won't scream. So he likes he me better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so T-Rex came to us because he was found in a truck yard. There was an old tractor trailer truck. Maybe he won't be quiet. <laughs> there was an old tractor trailer truck where the parents nested. There was a, a square tube underneath the, the truck itself where they could fly in either side. They had their nest in the middle. It was waterproof. It was out of the sun. It was perfect. Until they decided to bring the tractor trailer truck into the bay and work on it and fix it up. Well, four of these little guys popped out of the uh, container. Three of them scooted under the fence out to the field, and this one just sat there. So what we realized was we um, raised them to be released. They eat grasshoppers and crickets and all sorts of things, so they're not competing with the red tails, with the rats, or the rabbits. But these guys can catch a sparrow uh, with no problem at all. In fact, they used to be called sparrow hawks. Has anyone ever heard that term? Yeah. And once the Americans realized that there's another hawk in England called a sparrow hawk, they decided they needed to rename our sparrow hawks to American kestrels. So they're not American. They're in every continent except Antarctica. But they're remarkable birds in that they 
have all these different adaptations to be able to um, do what they do, which is sometimes they migrate up to 15,000 miles round trip. Um, falcons, I'm talking the bigger falcons, not these guys. These guys go to Florida and the Keys and then come back in the spring. Whereas the peregrines sometimes, or the um, other jeer and desert falcons, sometimes go to the tip of South America. So um, in order to stay hydrated and fed, falcons have learned to hunt on the wing, which means as they're flying on their migration, they'll fly through a flock of birds, pick one, grab it, or, or butt it with their feet. The bird tumbles with a big puff of feathers, and then they fly down, catch it, bring it up to their mouth, take a bite, and they keep on going. So we thought we invented fast food. <laughs> we didn't. They also, during the migration, um, have uh, bad weather, but falcons, they actually like it. The more windy it is, the better it is. Um, just like vultures. When you see vultures in the wind, they kind of tip all over the place. These guys, they just ride it. It's like a big wave, and uh, they just, they love it. So falcons have an extra baffle in their nostrils. It's for, um, it kind of looks like a pimple inside an open nostril. And that little baffle is to divert the wind when they're doing a stoop at 240 miles per hour. So imagine you're flying at 240 miles per hour. Our lungs would explode or something. I mean, it would not be, be good. But because of the baffle, they can dive and, and catch their food, and it's just flawless. They do have to be feather perfect. Um, they also have an alula, which is a thumb in their shoulder, which is kind of like they use it for cutting and dipping and doing sharp turns. Um, when a falcon is in a stoop, it's got its eyes on its target, and it can't take its eyes off because it's just like a baseball you'll miss. So they constantly have their eyes on that duck or their, that target, and as they're in the stoop, they actually spiral, which is crazy. Um, falcons also have, it's called a mustache under their eyes, and that is to keep the sun from reflecting back up into their their vision. Um, sports players do that. Where do you think they got that idea? Falcons. Also, the uh, stealth bombers, um, the invisible airplanes that the Army and um, our, our forces have made, they, they developed it after the Falcon. And the Falcon's light underneath and dark on the top so if he was flying, he's got, he's got um, kind of zigzags under his wings. And that's an optical illusion with a bird. With you move your wings, it's going to disappear. And so the proof to that, has anyone ever seen zigzags on a white page? You, you look at it, stationary, and it's zigzags on a white page. If you do this, the zigzags disappear. So it's an optical illusion that nature has perfected and uses it for um, camouflage while they're hunting. These birds, he's so good right now, I don't dare get near him. He, um, these birds, you can tell the difference between them and morning doves. They often sit on the same phone wire or cable. Um, the morning doves have a tiny little head, a big body, and a long pointy tail. These birds would eat a morning dove if it was hungry, but if it's not hungry, it's not interested. So they sometimes are found on the same line next to each other. You're going to be able to pick out the American kestrel because his tail 
never stops bobbing. <laughs> of course he stops, right on? There, there we go. <laughs> so in the meantime, um, that's an easy giveaway. They have a, a much larger head, more streamlined body, and a fan tail. So you will be able to tell them apart. Um, these guys mainly eat little birds, um, starlings, sparrows, um, but they'll also eat grasshoppers, crickets, and anything else that moves. They'll eat a snake, um, but mainly birds you know, make up their entire diet. Anyone have questions about kestrels? Yes? These guys don't dive probably more than 60, 65 miles an hour. Um, so I'm really not sure, and I'm, I'm not sure that science really knows why the tail bobs. Um, they do know that in larger falcons, when they ruffle up and, and kind of settle in, it's called a rouse, and that means they're getting comfortable. So the body language of a falcon is going to look like He's shaking, and then he's relaxed. Maybe take one foot up. A lot of people come into our clinic and say, oh, that pigeon has one foot. I'm like, no, they just, they rest. You know, they have to, they're on their feet 24-7. Every bird is on its feet. They don't lay down to sleep. They don't, um, don't do anything that doesn't require their feet. So their feet is their strongest asset, and that's what they're going to use to protect themselves. Yes? Is there any of these birds that are in captivity that have uh, other birds that they uh, would they be released and then released, or would they? Um, it's illegal. Yeah, LSD, you repeat the question. Yes, the question. If these birds were to reproduce in captivity, what would I do? Um, first of all, it's illegal to breed any a wild bird in captivity without a proper permit. So unless you're a falconer and you're breeding these birds to sell, um, any bird that's raised in captivity technically can't be released because it didn't have a proper upbringing. I don't believe that. Did he just miss the... Yeah, he just missed the... <laughs> so... Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, now he's showing off. Yes. Uh, I have a question about um, how is, you know, how are these particular birds doing and how are birds in general doing and what are the biggest problems for birds? Okay. Question. Great question. So did everyone hear that question? Okay. Um, one of the answers is most birds are in decline. It's just the way it is. I would say one-third of our national birds are in decline. Um, the only owls that are in the upswing are the barred owls. And I'm not sure why, just that I know they're hardy, they are amazing parents, and they do spend longer than other owls with their babies. Um, there is a problem in California with the spotted owl. Um, the spotted owl is now endangered and um, being encroached upon with the barred owl. So the barred owls are coming into their territory and taking over, eating all the, the food and then moving out. So the spotted owls are really having a hard time. Um, but milli uh, billions of, of birds actually get caught by cats each year. It's tens of billions if you take in the whole world. And um, so what we advocate is keep your cat inside. They're not native. Um, they will hunt and kill anything without a permit. They don't have a license or a killing cycle where they leave the mama birds alone and just take the little ones. There's no 
I, they're poachers. And so um, I have two cats. I love cats. They're indoor cats. And it's much safer for the cats as well. Um, they don't get fleas and other diseases, rabies. Um, they don't get hit by cars. They don't get eaten by bald eagles or coyotes. So um, if you do have a cat and it's an indoor, outdoor cat, try and keep it indoors more than out. And eventually, make it an indoor cat. They get along fine. They'll, they'll get over it. As long as you keep their litter box clean, give them a nice spot in the sun to uh, rest, and play with them. So birds in general are all declining. There are some that are doing well, but most of them are not. So it's really kind of a critical time right now where um, I just want to call out attention to the rehabbers that do this work and help these birds give them a second chance so that, that we can keep more birds in the air longer and healthier. Um, it's better for us. It's better for the planet. Um, yes? Well, we have about two or three minutes okay. left. Yeah, we can put him away. So, yes. On the line with the last question that was asked, uh -huh. I've heard that the, um, the windmills that produce power have an effect on bird populations. What's your view on that? You know, it's a slippery slope. Um, at least it's not relying on oil companies but they do kill hundreds of birds a year. And so um, I would love to see um, flaps, you know, uh, ribbons, something to deter the birds because they can't see when a windmill is turning so, um, because it disappears, and that's what happens. That's when they fly into them. So, yes, they're good in one sense, but in another, they're not good for flying creatures. Yes. If there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this presentation is we can help these birds. We can help animals in the wild. Um, people can help. And so you always want to um, call a wildlife rehabilitator that is licensed. Many of them do it, and they don't really know what they're doing. We're educated every year with a, a big, long um, conference and keep up on all the latest medicines and, and uh, changes that happen in science. I want everyone to notice these birds as individuals. Once we learn a little bit about them, sometimes we want to learn more about them. If we start learning more, then we start to care somehow. And then the caring turns into compassion and then helping with the cause, either monetarily um, or you know, becoming a wildlife rehabilitator. So we have um, thousands of rehabbers in New York State and um, just about any pet store a uh, veterinarian or um, feed store is going to know the rehabbers in the area. So if you call a local vet because you see a bird and you're on vacation, um, they should be able to guide you to the right place. So um, last little thing I wanted to say was we, we got the phone call for Rocky, the, the little owl in the Christmas tree. And that was in 2020 when everything was closed up. COVID at its worst. The Christmas tree was cut down in Oneonta. We believe the bird flew into the tree when it was on the flatbed truck because any bird that has his wits about him is not going to sit in a tree that's going this way. So we believe uh, she flew into the tree before they had tied it down and, um, 
and went to sleep for the day while the workers compressed her into the tree. When we saw her, um, the woman said, well, she called and said, do you take in owls? And I said, yes. And she said, well, I don't have the owl with me. It's with my husband. He's at work. So I can't get him to you till later. And I just thought, well, why don't I just bean him at work and cut out the middleman? And in the meantime, um, she said, no, I don't think that's possible. He's setting up the Christmas tree in New York City. And I went, what? <laughs> What's an owl doing in the Christmas tree? So it was eight days of news, uh, reporters on my doorstep, um, every major network contacting me, doing Zoom classes. And so on the eighth day, after two vet visits and two specialists, we wanted to make sure she was going to be perfect to release, and we released her. You can see it on YouTube. Just type in um, Rocky release or the Christmas owl release, and you'll be able to see the, the whole um, release. But we wrote a book. It's for children. If you have any kids in your family that you'd like to give it to, it's great. The book is $20, and then we're selling ornaments as well, uh, and they're 30 So if you want to come up, look at some of the things we have, um, ask me questions, feel free. Thank you.